1 Kings 9 1 to 10 29 through the Bible chapters 9 to 10 theme the fame of Solomon the visit of the Queen of Sheba God appears to Solomon a second time to encourage him and he sets up David as a standard of measurement for him the remainder of these two chapters gives proof of Solomon's greatness and of the prosperity of his reign God appears to Solomon a second time and it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all Solomon's desire which he was pleased to do. That the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication, that thou hast made before me, I have hallowed this house, which thou hast built, to put my name there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. 1 Kings 9 1-3 God is saying to Solomon, I will meet with you here at the temple. This is the place for you to come, for the people to come, and for the world to come. This is the meeting place. And if thou wilt walk before me, as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart, and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and wilt keep my statutes and my judgments, 1 Kings 9 4. Now God charges Solomon, and if thou wilt walk before me, as David thy father walked, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever. David is a human standard, not a high standard according to God's standards. David had a tremendous capacity for God. He loved God but he failed, fumbled, faltered, and fell. But he got up and came to God in confession. He wanted to have fellowship with God. God told Solomon that he wanted him to walk before him as David his father had done, in integrity of heart. Integrity of heart is important for us today because there is so much subterfuge and hypocrisy in Christian circles. I spoke at a church banquet some time ago where there were over 1,000 people present. One of the politicians of that area got up and said a few words. You would have thought he was the most pious fellow in that crowd. But he managed to leave before the message. Do you know why? He did not want to hear it. He was not interested in God's Word. There is so much of that kind of hypocrisy today. One sees dishonesty and hypocrisy revealed on Sunday morning. Here comes a man out of the business world. He has been careless in his life, he has not been a good example in his home. Yet he walks into church with a Bible under his arm and talks about God and God's will, using all sorts of pious expressions. Whom is he attempting to fool? Does he think he is fooling God? My friend, we don't fool God. We might as well tell him the facts because he already knows them. David walked before God in integrity of heart. When he sinned, he confessed it and asked for cleansing. Although his faith failed for a moment, beneath the faith that failed was a faith that never failed. Imperfect though he was, God set him up as a standard. Walk before me, as David thy father walked. Then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel, 1 Kings 9 5. As long as Israel had a king, he was in the line of David. And there is one today in David's line whose nail-pierced hands hold the scepter of this universe. But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods, and worship them. Then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house, which I have hallowed for my name, will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people, 1 Kings 9 6-7. The Jews are certainly a proverb and a byword today. This has come to pass literally. And at this house, which is high, every one that passeth by it shall be astonished, and shall hiss, and they shall say, Why hath the Lord done thus unto this land, and to this house? And they shall answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken hold upon other gods, and have worshipped them, and served them, therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all this evil. 1 Kings 9 8-9. This also has come to pass literally. If you go to the spot where the temple once stood, you will see that it has been destroyed. The mosque of Omar now stands there. Why is the land of Israel like it is? 
Why is the mosque of Omar there? Israel forsook God, friend. That is the answer. Solomon's fame. Next we are told that Solomon and Hiram had a little difficulty. And it came to pass at the end of twenty years, when Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord, and the king's house. Now Hiram the king of Tyre had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees, and with gold, according to all his desire, that then King Solomon gave Hiram twenty cities in the land of Galilee. And Hiram came out from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, and they pleased him not, 1 Kings 9 10-12. When Hiram saw the twenty cities, he felt that he had not been given full payment for all that he had done for Solomon in the building of the temple. Actually there was a misunderstanding, and this is the thing that caused a breach between these two men. And he said, What cities are these which thou hast given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul unto this day. And Hiram sent to the king six score talents of gold, 1 Kings 9 13-14. This last sentence should read Hiram had sent, explaining that the cities were in payment for the gold he had furnished, the timber, stone, and labor had been paid for in corn, wine, and oil. And this is the reason of the levy which King Solomon raised, for to build the house of the Lord, and his own house, and Milo, and the wall of Jerusalem, and Hazor, and Megiddo, and Gezer. And Solomon built Gezer, and Bethor on the nether. And Baalath, and Tadmor in the wilderness, in the land. And all the cities of store that Solomon had, and cities for his chariots, and cities for his horsemen and that which Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, and in Lebanon, and in all the land of his dominion, 1 Kings 9 15, 17-19. This passage describes the extension of Solomon's kingdom and his tremendous building program. And King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezion Geber, which is beside Eloth, on the shore of the Red Sea, in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent in the navy his servants, shipmen that had knowledge of the sea, with the servants of Solomon. And they came to Ophir, and fetched from thence gold, 420 talents, and brought it to King Solomon, 1 Kings 9 26-28. Solomon just about cornered the gold market in that day. He also had quite a navy. Ezionjabur was situated on the eastern arm of the Red Sea. This was Solomon's seaport. It was situated near Israeli Eilat. It is thought that his navy extended its navigation as far away as Ophir in southwestern Arabia. Solomon is visited by the Queen of Sheba. The visit of the Queen of Sheba reveals that Solomon had succeeded in witnessing for God to the world of that day. Solomon's fame had spread, and obviously multitudes were coming to Jerusalem to worship the living and true God. In the present dispensation, the church is to go to the world but the commission to go into all the world was not given to the nation Israel. As Israel was true to God, she was a witness to the world, and the world came to Jerusalem to worship. In chapter 10 we have a great illustration of the influence of Solomon in that day. The visit of this queen shows the effect of the reign of Solomon, as God's representative, upon the nations of the world. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions, 1 Kings 10 1. The Queen of Sheba came to Solomon because of what she had heard. She had heard of a temple where man could approach God, she wanted to know about that. She had heard of Solomon's wisdom, so she came to test him with difficult questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices, and very much gold, and precious stones, and when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions, there was not any thing hid from the king, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom, and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her, 1 Kings 10 2-5. Now the phrase, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, should be translated, and his burnt offering by which he went up unto the house of the Lord. She witnesses that Solomon approached God by a burnt offering. 
This is the offering that speaks more fully of Christ and His substitutionary death than all the others. Hebrews 9:22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. The burnt offering was a testimony to the Queen of Sheba. She was also impressed with the wisdom of Solomon and with his building program, the palace, the temple and the other buildings. All around were bounty, luxury, and temporal prosperity. For a brief moment in time, God's people were faithful and true witnesses of Him. And so the Queen responds to all that she has seen and heard. And she said to the King, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words, until I came, and mine eyes had seen it, and, behold, the half was not told me, thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. 1 Kings 10 6-7. She had not believed half of what she had been told and came to find that the half had not been told her. And I don't think the half has been told today concerning our Lord. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee, to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel for ever, therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice, 1 Kings 10 8-9. This now is her testimony, and I think it reveals that she has come to know the living and true God. And she gave the king an hundred and twenty talents of gold, and of spices very great store, and precious stones, there came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon, 1 Kings 10 10. She brought a great amount of wealth and gave it to Solomon and the navy also of Hiram, that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of almug trees, and precious stones. And the king made of the almug trees pillars for the house of the Lord, and for the king's house, harps also and psalteries for singers. There came no such almug trees, nor were seen unto this day. 1 Kings 10 12 Hiram was king of Tyre, of the Phoenicians who were a seagoing people. We see here that Solomon continued his building program. He made pillars for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, also harps and psalteries for singers. And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants, 1 Kings 10:13. The story of the Queen of Sheba is one example of the many who came to know God at this time. Similarly, the Book of Acts records only certain conversions such as those of the Ethiopian eunuch, Saul of Tarsus and Cornelius. Yet we know that literally thousands came to know Christ during that period. And there were thousands who came to know God through the Temple in Jerusalem and the witness of the people of Solomon's day. Now we are told something of the gold that came to Solomon. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred three score and six talents of gold. Beside that he had of the merchantmen, and of the traffic of the spice merchants, and of all the kings of Arabia, and of the governors of the country. And King Solomon made two hundred targets of beaten gold, six hundred shekels of gold went to one target, 1 Kings 10 14-16. I cannot comprehend it when it says there were six hundred three score and six talents of gold that came to him every year, he simply cornered the gold market. The kingdom had reached its zenith. Actually, David brought it to this position, but now Solomon is the one who is able to move in and enjoy the peace, the plenty, and the prosperity. For the king had at sea a navy of Tharshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tharshish, bringing gold, and silver, ivory, and apes, and peacocks, 1 Kings 10 22. All of these are luxury items, apes for entertainment, these were Solomon's zoo, peacocks for beauty, and gold, silver, and ivory for magnificent decorations. There is a frivolous and tragic note here which is symptomatic of the condition of Solomon's kingdom. He is called to give a witness to the world, the world is coming to his door, and what does he do? He spends his time and energy with apes and peacocks simply to satisfy a whim. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. And all the earth sought to Solomon, to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart, 
1 Kings 10 23-24. It was during this period that the kingdom reached its zenith and was characterized by very faithful witnessing. We have seen that illustrated in the life of the Queen of Sheba, and now we are told that many others came to Jerusalem also. There was a real witness given to the world by Solomon, a witness for God. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver, and vessels of gold, and garments, and armor, and spices, horses, and mules, a rate year by year, 1 Kings 10 25. Frankly, the presence from these visitors enabled Solomon to build up a kingdom that was noted for its riches. Later, of course, that made Israel the subject of spoil by other nations when the kingdom was divided and weakened. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots, and twelve thousand horsemen, whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots, and with the king at Jerusalem, 1 Kings 10 26. Solomon, as he gathered horses and horsemen, expanded in a department in which God had forbidden him to expand. Solomon's stables would make these modern race tracks look like a tenant farmer's barn in Georgia. And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars made he to be as the sycamore trees that are in the vale, for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt, and linen yarn, the king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. And a chariot came up and went out of Egypt for six hundred shekels of silver, and an horse for an hundred and fifty and so for all the kings of the Hittites, and for the kings of Syria, did they bring them out by their means, 1 Kings 10 27-29. Solomon really built up tremendous wealth in the kingdom. At that time he actually cornered the market on gold, silver, and precious stones. My friend, what are you busy doing today? Are you getting out the word of God or are you in the business of gathering a bunch of apes? Do you pay more for entertainment than you do for the Word of God? How about the peacocks for beauty? More money is spent today on beauty preparations than is given to the Lord's work. What about gold, silver, and precious stones? Are you so busy making money that you have no time left for the Lord? Oh, my friend, we are called to witness to the world. God have mercy on us for going into the business of apes and peacocks. How frivolous!